For our afternoon plenary session, I'd like to invite David Bunker. David was recently appointed into the role of Executive Director, Brisbane Diamantina Health Partners. Prior to that, David was Executive Director, Queensland Genomics, a role which had a strong emphasis on leading the integration of health, research and education for better health outcomes. Please join me in welcoming David. Well, thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. Um, I'm also pleased that there's a nice turnout this afternoon as well, because I've been here all day, it's been fascinating. So look, I'm going to do a talk over the next um, 15 or so minutes with some time for Q&A, and completely unscripted, I will talk about learning health systems as well. Um, so what I'm going to do is try and address this provocative question about whether healthcare really cares about data. Um, and I guess the notion is, of course it does. The reality is that the healthcare system does care about data, but for a purpose. So, you know, the orientation around the collection of the data is to serve a particular purpose, and we'll talk a bit about that. We'll also cover this notion that um, as our health system transforms, the type of data that we collect will change. And so what will our orientation be around what we do with that data and what purpose we put that data to? Um, and then I'll do a little bit of a sort of call to arms at the end and we'll see how we go. So as introduced, my name's David Bunker. I'm uh, currently transitioning. I've been leading Queensland Health's $25 million genomics program. Our mission was to accelerate the adoption of genomics into everyday care. Uh, and that's been a, a really amazing program of work and it's sort of started to come towards its end. And late last year, the recruiters came to me around the role in Queensland's Health Research Translation Centre, another learning, health learning system. And I sort of, they said, what would it take, you know, to do the role? And I said, well, I'd have to convince myself that the health system was really serious about research and actually embedding research as a fundamental part of what we do in healthcare. So if I couldn't sort of convince myself that that's what the board wanted, um, then it wasn't something I was really interested in doing. Um, the board I have, however, is very influential. I have the Director General for Queensland Health. I have the Chief Executives of the big hospital and health services, our LHDs, or whatever you call them down here. Um, I have uh, Chief Executive of Primary Health Networks, uh, Executive Dean Medicine, Directors of Research Institutes, etc. So we've got all the right people in the room. And the reason I say this out loud is because it really takes that community. If it wasn't for my board, that group would not meet for any other purpose. It's the, that's the only time that they actually get together as a group. And if you're into the way boards and things like that work, this is effectively a shareholder board. But the trick is to not have them think as shareholders. The, think of them, the trick is for them to see themselves sitting around that room representing the system that delivers healthcare in Queensland. And so there's a real mindset here, and I felt very confident that that's what the board were doing and that their priorities and that was a sort of collaboration and program I'd be interested in engaging. Uh, prior to that, very quickly, the reason I sort of have any you know, expertise in e-health was because I was one of the leaders in the national e-health program. Uh, so I had executive accountability for strategy and architecture, for clinical informatics and standards, for cybersecurity, and for the innovation platform for the National Health Transition Authority. And during my time there, I was responsible for the architecture of the PCHR, and I always say not what they delivered, but what we designed to different things. Um, also not responsible for community engagement, which is another thing that probably wasn't done terrifically well. But I've got, you know, 12, 13 years in health, and my focus is on innovation. My academic area is actually in management science and uh, transformation and digital. So here I am. Alrighty, so we know this is what the health system looks like today. It's the 80-20 rule. We spend a whole bunch of money and time working on people who are a very small number of people who are very sick. We know that the trends are saying that the cost of delivering healthcare in the manner that we do today is not sustainable. Australia does very well. We have, uh, compared to OECD nations, we are one of the top health systems in the world. We're number one sort of in that administrative sort of perspective. And like I said, that means we do care about data as it relates to the cost of activity, um, but um, I guess you know even with our you know 9.5 whatever it is percent of GDP, we still can't afford it. I can't imagine what the US is thinking when they're approaching 20% GDP. So the ability to rapidly you know transform and apply knowledge is really going to be I think where the key um, the key system is, and and this is sort of fraught at the moment because the health delivery system and the research industry, they are two different systems. There's a whole bunch of federal, state, you know, stuff that gets involved. Um, but as I said, I'll come to that call to arms later because it's about how we all connect and, and get on with it. Uh, so we have to move away from this kind of trial and error approach, start managing illness and 
as I say, increase the focus on preventing illness and keeping healthy people healthy. Healthy. It's the best thing we can do for the economy and for the health system is to keep people out of it uh, and give them a red hot crack at um, having good lives. So precision healthcare is one of the things that I, I use as a way of framing what's happening in terms of the transformation. I want to really make the point that this is a disruption to the system. Um, the health system is very good in terms of administration. And as long as you can count activity sort of historically, you can kind of predict you know, what services you might need in the future. But this presupposes that the health system is linear. Okay, if you've got a nice tidy business that you run and you know, cost of goods sold and the cost of supply is the same going forward, that's terrific, good for you. But the reality of health is it's changing because of the burden of disease and an ageing population and it's also being disrupted by significant technologies and there are sort of some at the bottom that are powering that, things like advances in bioscience. Um, I spent the last three and a half years very focused on genomics. Um, but also digital technologies, consumer engagement, and what I talk about is a sensible conversation about what is value, what does value represent. So think value-based healthcare uh, and, and a shift away from just counting activity and paying for activity to what that activity actually buys us. So um, living in a sort of a data-driven health system, so I'm not going to read all the stuff in here, but we all know these slides and pictures and we understand that content that's born digital or digitised because of the hybrid nature of the world we live in um, has a lot of opportunity. So this is sort of a notion. So I'm sort of starting to try and get this shift in thinking to well, what do we do with that data and how do we actually present those data sets? Because for the health system that's investing in electronic health and digital health programs and digital hospitals, they're collecting all this information. Um, but it, it's really got to be a focus on what that information actually does. So how does it drive better clinical practice um, and, and provide a better tool for clinicians? How does it actually present data kind of longitudinally in the system? So we're not just thinking about me as a patient in the hospital being treated, but me as a cohort of patients moving through a ward. And we talk about falls management in aged care and, and all these sorts of things. So that longitudinal perspective you get if you're running a hospital with a digital EHR lets you look through what's actually happening. So there's a, a health system system and system measures that we should be gaining here. Research and discovery, it's a no-brainer. All of the groups that I work with in a research capacity all want access to data, but it, that's not the problem. It's getting access to data. It's things like consent and data linkage and all of these clunky, slow systems that we have in place today that we've really got to work out how we can refine uh, and make work um, simpler. Uh, one example from the BDHP, the Brisbane Diamantina context, is the notion of a, what we have as a, a passport agreement, which is a sort of a Uber MOU contract that all the partners agree to. The notion is that it streamlines when projects commence because we've kind of sorted out all of the IP issues. But often these projects, you know, it's a good starting point, but it's not always going to work in every case. But the notion is how to do that better. Um, and that's certainly a message that I have for all of our leaders in the health system is we've really got to do the business of translation better and the business of healthcare better. Um, and of course education and training. If you can imagine all these data sets that are available and what would it look like, um, and we had an example this morning of one of the universities here that are including this sort of notion of digital health into the medical practice and the, you know, what's happening with clinicians or, or young doctors coming out of universities. It's, it's absolutely critical to think about how all this information can be used for those purposes. Um, so this is just a little slide I like to include to go, well, you know, how much data? So in 2018, um, there was 33 zettabytes or 33 trillion gigabytes of information produced. So between 2015 and this year, that was a tenfold increase in the volume of data that was being generated in the health system alone. Okay, and if you're a bit nerdy like me and you like to think of what would that mean, that would mean that in one year, this year, we'll produce 880 billion, that's right, no, 880,000 billion million um, DVDs, uh, or you can boil it down into just 97 grams of DNA. So you want to know why the human genome is so complicated? That's how much you can pack into it. So the other really important shift, and this comes from the genomics world, is where is the data coming from? And so the prediction is that in 2025, or 2025, 60 million patients will have been had their, their, their genome sequenced in health delivery. So in 2012, it was only about 1% of all the human genome sequence was done in healthcare. All of the rest is done in research, okay? And of course, all the researchers are in little silos of activity and trying to work out how they can share data and get more access to it. The more access 
we have to the genomic information and rich clinical phenotypical information that goes with that, the more we can improve our understanding and apply those lessons into the health system to apply genomics meaningfully. Between 2018 and 2022, we're seeing a complete shift. So by 2022, 80% of all the human genomes sequenced will actually happen in healthcare. So the question begs, how will researchers get at that? Now, uh, for my sins, one of the things I ended up picking up was um, a project that the Australian Health Minister's Advisory Council is funding to develop a digital genomics blueprint for Australia. So a national approach to genomic information management. And I, when I scoped the work, I said, look, I, you know, I, I think we should do it. And, and it falls underneath the Commonwealth Department of Health's National Genomics Health Pop, um, Policy Framework, uh, where their priority area number five is around data, and say, well, how do we actually think of a complete ecosystem of both research and health delivery, and how are we gonna share information? I know I won't bore you with where we're going with that, but we're beavering away madly at the moment. But the important thing was that the stakeholders and the collaborative program to get to that digital blueprint had to be founded when we had health delivery people and researchers sort of at the same table and working out what a common system was that gets past a lot of this clunky kind of extract, transform, load, you know, between different settings and move the research and the compute, if you're into IT, over the top of the data, um, not unlike what the NHS has done. So we're certainly looking at those big programs, but this is a really good reflection of the volume of information that's coming and where it's coming from and who might want to use that and how we use it to improve healthcare. Okay, so I'm a systems theorist person from a management science point of view. So I see health as a complex adaptive system. So this won't surprise you if you've worked in it, it's non-linear, it's dynamic, it's composed of independent actors, and the reality is for a lot of those actors, those folks involved in the system, the kind of KPIs and benchmarks that they get to drive their businesses don't always align with this sort of natural, harmonious learning health system. And often they actually contradict each other. And, and I can tell you, having run the programs the last couple of years in genomics and now moving forward with all of you know, health and research translation in Queensland, that you know, the, the sorts of things that the Executive Dean of Medicine is trying to drive in his institute and his organisation versus the Director General or a CEO of a hospital, they're very different things. So bringing them to consensus uh, is very important, where they see that they all have a role in the mission for the organisation and how their organisations will get value from, from that, um, that, that interaction. And the trick with the definition here is that it then adapts and tends to come from self-learning. So this is where we really start to introduce this idea of where a health learning system fits in. Um, so what I've done here is I've adapted this from a really great paper on the convergence of implementation science, precision medicine and learning healthcare systems. So what I've sort of done is sort of the, sort of, well, where are the intersections of these, these theories and these frameworks? What does it look like for us as we go forward? So understanding that from a precision healthcare point of view, what we're trying to do is understand the optimal use of genomics and behaviour data, clinical data, and ongoing development of genomics evidence. So this is obviously you know, a pitch when I'm trying to get more funding and direction into genomics. Um, and there are other aspects of precision healthcare, but that notion of the optimal use is key. This idea that in a learning health system that we're data driven and we can see health system improvement. I was so pleased with the presentations we've had today that talked about an improvement system because that's really you know, the sort of orientation I have. And a focus on iterative and ongoing learning. This idea that we're gonna get all the answers and it's kind of version one of the world and then there's some magical change and we've got version two. Health just doesn't work like that. Uh, in the 2009 eHealth strategy that we basically drove NIDA, uh, it said that there were different groups coming from different starting places and moving at different speeds. So, you, you know, getting everybody up to the same version at the same time in terms of GP software is a kind of a crazy notion. So the only alternative is continuous improvement and continuous release. And there are a lot of things we can learn from the ICT sector here. Um, and the other thing is, of course, that all stakeholders have to participate. And then when we think about implementation science, this theories and strategies to drive health system improvement, one of the key things we need to do is not just understand the supply side of it, all of the amazing translational research and potential, and the demand side of it from the health system is in what's the burden of care, where can we actually address problems and issues for you. We also have to have the measures so that all of the people at the table are walking away going, demonstrably this investment resulted in this project that had a set of outputs and someone cared about those outputs because those outputs became an outcome for them with a, a real measure. 
and measures that work for ministers and measures that work for clinicians and for patients. So getting that mix right is important and implementation science gives us a lot of the understanding of that multi-level context. Now what I did then was to sort of think, well, what's actually happening at the intersection? So we think about precision healthcare in a learning health system. What's the practical, what's the desirable, achievable level of personalised care that we can get? So what's the notion of the intent of the collaboration and the project investment? If we look at the intersection between implementation science and learning health system, how do we deliver this context sensitive improvement of practices? Okay, because there are different measures and there are different drivers. So we have to understand for the stakeholders participating, what are the drivers, what are the measures, and how does that context of improvement work? And you'll all know that you know, what people say and think versus what they do are, you know, tend to be very different things. So understanding the behavioural and social and psychological nature of these, this change is also really important. And then I guess finally, you know, and this is about data, what are we going to do to manage the abundance of data that we have and how are we going to go at that in a meaningful way? So sort of getting towards the end of the slide or the presentation, um, the Queensland University of Technology have a, a chair in digital economy, uh, Professor Marek Kavalkovic. Terrific guy. I love working with Marek because Marek comes at this about digital transformation and industry. He's not a health person. Uh, but he wants to understand how health works. And they had this notion of the evolution of the health system from production to industrialising, automation, digitisation, personalisation. So it's a reasonable notion of the evolution of, of the health system. And it obviously translates onto the you know, industrial revolution and those sorts of concepts. And we've seen this transformation in transport and finance and a whole you know, bunch of other industries. In fact, you know, when I was running architecture in the e-health program, we used to have this little sort of internal joke that if we did nothing else, we would, we would drag the health system kicking and screaming into the 1980s. That was our, our mission. Um, and we also worked out, oh no, I won't say that. Um, I'll just stop now, too many, too many stories. But the question is, where are we up to? Because from an academic framework point of view, these notions are nice and they're clean, but we also know that the health system is messy. It's complex and, uh, you know, and it's, it, it's difficult to get your head around. So this idea that we're naturally in you know, version three of the world and we're moving to four, or we're all starting to imagine five with customer focus and what the strategic differentiators are for these organisations providing care, um, that it's actually really mixed. You know, we're certainly not at four and five. I can absolutely show you things in hospitals today where they're obsessed with you know, quality patient survivability. These are really important concepts and they become big investments to try and understand. There are also parts of the health system stretching right out into things like you know, customer wellbeing and quality of life. So it's a nice framework and the reason I show it is because it actually reflects the messiness of the system we're in. And the other thing I want to sort of leave you with from this presentation is that it also reflects the type of information that we're going to gather. So if we're back here doing quality and patient survivability, it's relatively easy to count patients that survive an intervention or an episode of care because they're the ones that don't die. And it's relatively simple. But if we're starting to think about customer and lifelong partnerships, the relationship an individual has not just with their clinician, but other things that are going on in their lives, their education, their children, you know, all of these sorts of larger e-citizen issues that we're going to have to grapple with, and the way governments will collect data about us with the theory that we'll get better government services. These notions are really important, and it reflects the types of data that we're going to collect. And then the call to arms is to go, well, what are we going to do with that information? And, um, and I guess that's really sort of, you know, the end of the talk. Um, this is a quote I maybe said to someone earlier on, the chair of the World Economic Health Forum last year, World Economic Forum last year had this quote. Um, and I'm not going to read it because you're all probably reading it right now. Um, when I got the job in BDHP, amongst all of the other interviews and bizzo that you go through with the board and stakeholders, um, they actually gave me this quote and said, you know, speak for 45 minutes on this topic. And this was actually the reason that I went, oh, this is absolutely the sort of thing that I want to do. I want to be involved in a collaborative program. It's a learning health system. We're trying to do you know, improvements in the way we deliver care and we're binding and bonding all these people together. And so for me, this was a really telling story of the vision that the board I have has for what they want to do in Queensland. And we want to be a collaborative member of the Australian Health Research Alliance and learn and use everything everyone else has got and, and tell everyone about what we're doing as well. Um, so this is, uh, I guess, the, the end of the talk.
So you were talking about your board at the start and there's a theme running through today around collaboration and working together and bringing together people with different skills and ways of seeing the world. Um, and it's a very nice thought and a great thing when you can achieve it, but it also means people who are seeing the world differently, learning how to speak the same language. Um, what has been your experience in that space? Yeah. Um, so I guess, yes, yeah, so I, I referred to the board because I'm just trying to show that there's intent at the top. The reality is the doers. It's always the doers. Um, I have a thing, I talk about the permafrost, you know, the, the board will say, yes, go and do all this magical stuff, but it doesn't filter down into the business. It's very difficult. But the reality is, you know, the vast majority of clinicians want better tools to do a better job. They want to be more efficient. They want to be more effective. A whole bunch of them have a, a real interest in, you know, being able to be engaged in innovation and better practice. And what we want to do is have a, you know, research is what underpins that because it represents good, strong evidence and a scientific method. Um, likewise, researchers are dying to collaborate and get access to data and translate their life's work into clinical practice. So I see no impediment really at that level. Um, people like me, who, and I'm, I'm not a clinician, I'm not a researcher, I'm not, I'm not any one of the, you know, the people involved. I, I say I, I don't have a horse in the race. My job is to be an enabler for that collaboration. And um, Chuck's point about the platform is absolutely critical. That notion that there is this I described uh, at lunchtime, it's sort of like a living wage. You know, to, for every network that wants to work together, there should just be this basic platform that supports collaboration and the tools to exchange information. It's kind of like, you know, like I said, a living wage. It just should be there. And then what you want to do is invest in those networks if you need to accelerate them or they're in a journey and, you know, you're trying to move them along. So I think that's the trick. Uh, it, it's not hard. It's just, you know, enabling people and reducing the, the barriers. As someone new, I wonder if you could comment, that I am, I wonder if you could comment on Australia's, um, like where they're at in the value-based healthcare journey. Yeah, sure. Um, so I know, I mean, I can't talk for other jurisdictions. I've been sort of landed in Queensland for the last few years, but certainly Queensland Health do have a notion around that idea of what does value-based healthcare look like, and there's been a number of initiatives to do that. And we talk about how long it takes for the health system to have, you know, discovery translate into everyday care, you know, 17 year journey. Um, it's a worry when the system is built on WOWs and QWOWs. So WOW is a weighted activity unit. That's the lingua franca, you know, of health delivery. So the feds literally, you know, have, you know, Queensland Health System provide public acute care. Um, and Q WOWs, weighted activity unit, is, is, is the, you know, the, that's the currency. And then likewise, the department purchases healthcare from a hospital. And when you're running a program like the genomics one, and we come along and we're building evidence alongside the clinical work and understanding the system effect, they say, well, what's your cost benefit analysis? And so I say, well, how, tell me how you do cost benefit analysis now. And they go, well, we look at the last couple of years of data and that lets us predict what we want going forward. And I said, well, what happens when something new comes along, like a new test? And then it's this weird, clunky, you know, system. Um, and so these types of innovations and disruptions are really challenging the system, but I think it's good because it's forcing the hand of the bureaucracy to be able to work out what value really means and engage patients. And Queensland Health, to their credit, I know nothing about the details, but just to their credit, have recently put a PREMS and PROMS program in as well and invested to understand what patient reported, expect, uh, patient reported outcomes and patient reported PREMS experience measures, <laughs> there's just so many acronyms in my head, uh, um, you know, what they really mean. So I think they've got their toe in the water. Um, and I think the, what I tried to do, I went and saw the dire Deputy Director General for Healthcare Purchasing and System Performance, and I explained what I was doing in the program around implementing. And he said, you know, you're gonna make my life difficult because the hospital have all this great evidence for doing this genomics testing, and I'm gonna to have to say no or pay for it or whatever. So I'm sort of like, help me help you. You know, give me someone from your team who can partner with the hospital executive and the clinicians and health economists to work out what your version of value is and what your version on return on investment is. So it, it's really that. And so things like genomics, data, digital health, these are all great prompters to help move that problem in the system forward. And I, I try and get on board with those sorts of activities rather than try and defend, you know, Queensland Weighted Activity Unit for blah. This very hard when they've never done it before. Thank you. Uh, great talk. Regarding your talk on the healthcare industry revolution and, yeah. and yeah. the permafrost as well, 
uh, what are a few, should we focus and jump towards the customer, focusing on the consumer itself? Or should we still try to make change with the providers, yeah. which are often quite conservative in some ways? Yeah, this Thank is a you. good one. Yeah. Um, so I tell healthcare leaders that retail is coming for their business. Okay. So, and that's because I want them to respond to things like direct-to-consumer market for genomics testing. You know, the, the simple answer there is to provide good information. You know, I'm almost certain the health system could provide that test cost-effectively, use the data that they get out of it, and provide information in a more trusted format with NADA accredited labs. Uh, so I don't really understand why they sort of haven't made that mental leap yet, but I think the reality of, of, of the digital age is more and more access for people to services. And, you know, look at the transformation in the, in the dental world. You know, you can go to a sort of a, some sort of little hole in the wall and get them to scan your mouth and start sending you different versions of templates that'll fix your teeth over time. Um, you know, no orthodontist or dentist necessarily need to be involved. Um, so I think the healthcare system has to take, not a retail focus, that's lame, right? But certainly the notion of who is the patient, who's, who's the customer, because if you're a clinician and you're providing care in a hospital and the department is funding it, this idea of where the customer is and who you're doing the work for is, is maybe different from the notion of what the patient relationship is. So it's a disconnect in our system, but I, I, won't, I won't go into democratic socialism and things like that. But anyway, the world is changing and we need to be on top of it. Um, yes, uh, about this time last year, I went to a, set, uh, a meeting on digital health, e-health, and on my Telstra um, and a whole bunch of people. And the first quarter, third of the session was uh, a lot of people advocating for the use of fax machines as being the best way for clinicians to actually communicate with each other. Yep. Uh, only to emphasise the amount of inertia that's yep. actually in the system. Yep. A lot of us here in this room would be people in the middle of all this stuff. What would be your experience, from your experience, what's the best way for us to, to advocate um, or try to get things moving? Would it be trying to get a top-down motion, like going to our leaders and our CEOs and our deans and so on? Or is it better to be pushing for a bottom-up approach, which has the greatest chance of getting up and working for us? Um, the answer is middle out. So this idea that top down, top down is about trying to get consensus and no one really wins. You know, it's a, for my money, just my opinion, it's a drive to mediocrity, right? Bottom up, terrific, thousand flowers blooming, how do you know what's a weed, how do you know what's a flower? So that's, and, and how do you exchange? You know, there's a whole lot of elegant, you know, sharing or whatever. So a middle out approach, I think is the right one, which is to say you've got to have a case at the top for why this wouldn't work. And you should be arguing the things that drive them from a measurement perspective. Quality and safety, you know, economics and value, that's the language of that world. The bottom up is to provide the fertile ground for innovation and discovery and failing fast and, and doing all those sorts of things. So, you know, there's no kind of one set of language that I would use in my conversation. My, my job's to be a boundary spanner, and that's what I try and do. You know, I understand the language of the board and the executive, but I understand what you know, clinicians, or I try, attempt to understand all these languages. So I think that's the right approach, is to say that there's no one single approach and try and, as I say, go middle out. Um, once again, I'll refer to the eHealth strategy from 2009. It actually talked about market management, the role of government, and it contrasted a system like the UK with a system like America, and it said one of the things that you need to do is manage the market. We've had secure messaging providers here for a long time and they're all operating on standards. So there's some other bizarre incentive that impedes the natural progress here and it's not the manufacturers of fax machines. So I think getting to the bottom of these sorts of things is really important and, and part of a learning health system is the reality is you stumble across these wild, crazy things that hold the thing back. Um, so we want a geneticist at an MDT in the cancer program, but the geneticist doesn't attract any QWOW to be at that MDT. And the MDT can't get the MBS item if the patient's not there, right? So you've got to have a system that finds these sorts of issues and escalates them to a point where they can be resolved. Because most of the time they go, oh, right, yeah, of course we want geneticists over there. How do we work out what a WOW is and right, add that WOW to the list? 
So there's ways of working through them, but it, it kind of takes a team, it takes a village. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone.